analysis systems in the utility uh, to be able to understand and coordinate with the uh, distributed energy resources. So this is requiring skills uh, that, you know, some are, are traditional to the utility and some are, are new. Um, so as we start to see larger volumes of this on the grid, obviously we still need our general power engineers or controls and protection engineers and things like that um, that we have today at the utility. We're also probably seeing a need for increased telecommunications engineers as we start to build out networks to, to get some situational awareness, uh, controls and automation engineers. We're seeing software engineers and IT professionals that also have a need to understand how the grid works. It's not just, can I move uh, bits and bytes to certain places and store them, but what do those bits and bytes actually mean and how it'll affect the grid? Uh, that also includes cybersecurity. Uh, that's going to be a critical, critical piece of this. And then one that really hasn't been mentioned yet is data scientists, which now need to analyze a tremendous amount of data. We used to be talking about, you know, we had 10, you know, 5, 10, 15 generators out there. They're all centrally located. Now we're talking about 15, 20,000 generators spread out all over the system. And that's a tremendous amount of data that we have to digest and be able to plan and operate our system. So right. pretty much uh, what we're seeing on the utility side, and I can throw it back um, to the uh, moderator, <laughs> whoever that wow. is. Now. Thank you. Thank you, John. Yeah, you basically uh, had like six seconds left on my little timer there. That was perfect. Thank you. Um, so now we will move on to Bill Kipnis from Siemens. Thank you, Frank. For those of for those of you who don't know Siemens, we compete for top global positions in battery energy storage, wind turbines, microgrids, um, and energy management software. I'm our, I'm our senior project developer for energy conservation in New Mexico. Today, I'm gonna play recruiter and, and speak to you as if you're looking for a promotion or a start in distributed energy um, workforce. Um, and, and tell you a little bit about what we're looking for. What skills are in the highest demand uh, for us that you can pass, pass on? First, uh, building, in, building automation, energy, um, and storage service technicians are our number one job shortage. Frankly, due to the high demand and, and short supply that we have, we're hiring novices as well as experts. So you do not have to have a large amount of experience to get started with Siemens or a company like us. We're very short in, in uh, the fields of business development, sales, account executives, whatever you wanna call them. We do not necessarily need hardcore STEM students. We think that's a little bit of a misallocation of resources in, in today's workforce. So um, if you're a well-rounded person, um, you are a people person, we believe you'll make better partners with our customers than somebody who's, whose head is, is down and, and, and sticks to STEM work. Um, uh, and who knows, you might be able to use your, your social media skills in this digital age to advance your career um, in combination with working in distributed energy. Uh, we are also very short in project management and, and particular entry level project management um, because we're not seeing a lot of people who know what it is and are interested in doing it. So are you well organized? Uh, do you label your drawers at home? Do you, do you, or do you even think about labeling them? Um, you might want to think about looking into project management. And by the way, a good project manager can build a PV array um, or a car. It's really the same to that skill set. It's very, it's very valuable. Um, now I'm going to switch to um, industry education and what companies like Siemens and what we're doing um, to solve the workforce shortage. It's obviously not enough to just talk about it. At FCCC, um, as the sister program to the Microgrid Training Center, we're helping to add the Building Automation Training Center. Together, uh, the two technologies create the BEAM Training Center, which, was, which is Building Energy Automation and Microgrid Training Center. Uh, which obviously uh, George and Frank have spoken about today. You know, briefly, um, uh, we want to we wanna teach people to blend the supply of power with the use of power inside of buildings or cars or other assets. Um, 
It's how to run systems from lighting to cooling um, and learn the software that runs them. Because I, I'll tell you what, more and more, these softwares that, that run the production of energy and run the assets that use them are, blend, are blending into single user interfaces. And we're seeing the need for people who can manage both types of assets. So if you start with your interest in, in HVAC, you may find yourself in demand to understand solar power and energy storage and the software that runs them all. Um, and thanks very much. Nice to talk to you today. All right, thank you very much. Um, I see that, um, let me get a little echo here. I see that we've got Bernie now. Yeah, sorry about the technical difficulties. I had a problem with the Wi-Fi. Very sorry. Okay, no, that's fine. So what we've uh, decided to do was go forward with this, with the panel. Um, and, as, and then after we move through the panel, then we will circle back to do our interview, if that's okay with you. Sounds great, Frank. Thank you. Okay. Are you, are you ready then right now, or should I circle back for your four minutes? Whatever is good for you. If you're ready, go for it. So... If you'd like to go ahead and do your um, give your um, your four minute panel presentation right now, that would be wonderful. Uh, I understood there was some uh, some questions you wanted to ask. Well, that or... that'll be at the end. Um, that'll be at the end. Um, All right, then I'll I'll uh, I'll go at the end. Okay, thank you very much. All right, so we're going to move on then to Gary Oppendo. Uh, well, hello, hey, hey, I'm Gary Oppendo, Vice President of Emerging Technologies at uh, Merit Technologies. It's good to be with you this morning. Talk about three of my favorite passions in which we're all aligned, renewables, resiliency, and microgrids. What we at Amera Technologies have done is designed and implemented a microgrid that's simple to install and operate, totally scalable, totally interoperable with the current bulk power and grid, and it's in uh, front of the meter. This is a true New Mexico story. Amera, a $30 billion utility hold co, comes to New Mexico, buys New Mexico Gas Company. Along the way, they discover the beauty, diversity, resources, talent, and are uh, con convinced to stay here and, and do work here. What we, what we developed is a skunk works, uh, looking at what is the future of energy. And you know it's easy to predict the future if you keep a keen eye on the inevitable. What's inevitable? DERs, uh, solar storage, um, and that leads you to microgrids. And what better place to put a microgrid that in a place that has, we're number one in something in New Mexico, and that's Elcor, the lowest cost of renewable energy. And, uh, and, and that leads to, led to a partnership with uh, Sandia National Labs and UNM, uh, and we put a, a, a microgrid on, a Kirt on Kirtland Air Force Base. If you uh, do the next slide, please. Uh, my friend, uh, Boss Akil earlier, uh, talked about uh, a microgrid and how useful that is. What we've basically done here is created a whole on. A whole on is a, 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 as any part breaks off, it becomes a whole. So, uh, every house has its own solar, its own storage, its own power electronics, its own controls. It's more effective if it's part of a network. That's more effective if you have some backup energy as a central server, if you know the analogy. That's more effective if you, if you stay tied to the grid. If you lose the grid, you have all the resources of the microgrid, as a boss explained earlier. We've really made a meshed network of energy nodes. If you go to the next slide, and basically that just scales up to a, a, a series of a grid of grids, if you will, which, which forms that, that mesh network. So if you wanna stop sharing your screen and I'll share mine. So the, the thing I wanna show you here, this is not an animation, this is not a, uh, a, a simulation. This is real time, our microgrid that's been operating on, on uh, Kirtland Air Force Base since last year. Uh, on the dashboard, you can see we've saved 268 tons of CO2. Uh, we're 153% solar to load on this. And we have a complete, what you're seeing there is the yellow is the solar coming off the roofs. The green is the microgrid energy the, and the blue is the AC. This is real time right now on our little quarter megawatt microgrid at, at Kirtland Air Force Base. What you see here is like a boss talk, talked earlier from a workforce standpoint with the ama amazing amount of operations and data you get out of this. We need solar techs, energy techs. Uh, we are working with Sandia National Labs on cyber. We'll need some cyber techs 
We need controls techs. And as John said, we're going to need data scientists. You see that bar at the bottom there? That's every, every second by second, watt by watt, all the data since we originally started up this microgrid. So um, we, what we're looking for is in there, in, in this little diagram, you're seeing ultimate smart metering, energy storage, EV chargers, intelligent networks, demand response, all available. And we're now looking out into the commercial realm uh, to with working with our IOU partners and uh, developers to get this out into New Mexico. We're already into Florida and California, which has bigger poles. That's why I asked earlier about uh, boss about re regulations. We need to get things going in New Mexico because this microgrid offers secure energy as a service, renewables as a service, resilience as a service, operations as a service, and data as a service. And so uh, we want to do this here in New Mexico and expand it here in New Mexico. Thanks. Perfect. Thank you, Gary. Um, next up, we have uh, Teoko Sadowick from Positive Energy Solar. Okay, if you could move to the second, next slide. Next slide. Thanks. My name is Tayoko Sadwick, and I'm a co-owner of Positive Energy. Thanks everyone for organizing this. I think it's really important for us to link workforce development with uh, employers and the community. Um, Positive Energy has gone through a, a, a several phases. The first phase was before uh, there was any incentives back um, before 2006. A lot of um, of our emphasis was highly technical, required a high degree of training and, and skills, and it was also very small. The cost of off-grid was 10x, the cost of grid power, and energy efficiency was an imperative. The next slide. This next slide um, <clears throat> basically uh, resulted in a ramp up, and this was a result of the Mexico's RPS law that was passed in 2006. And we call this the solar coaster because vendors came and went, uh, incentives uh, introduced and then phased out. There was an incredible amount of standardization and the standardization reduced <clears throat> the barriers to entry for uh, companies like Positive Energy. And perfect. Uh, the next slide here is this new phase that we're going into we're seeing more and more customers electrify their home. They're turning their gas heating to, uh, to electric, electric heat pumps. They're doing EVs. And basically this is doubling and tripling the size of their loads at the source. And they're also considering battery systems which will help the self-consumption. <clears throat> the next slide. Um, one of the stepping way back and looking at the big picture here, this shows you the, uh, in New Mexico, the trends of gas, petroleum, and coal. And basically the ETA that was addressed, addressed the utility side and said, okay, we're gonna convert 40% of the fossil fuels to electricity. <clears throat> there's still 60% that hasn't been addressed and that's at the consumer business government level. And that um, according to climate scientists say is the real challenge. We have to electrify everything to get um, on this path um, of climate reduction, climate stabilization. And <clears throat> Important thing here is that all stakers holders are going to have to get together um, because it requires a lot more integration between utilities and uh, policy and infrastructure development. Uh, next slide. So positive energy. This is a this is a profile of positive energy um, starting up. We've been in business for about 20 years, over 20 years, and you can see that the um, each one of these categories, formal training, NAPSEP, which is a, a industry certification and electrician's license are were essential at the beginning for all employees who weren't working. And now 
it's tapered down to the point where 41 of our employees um, have minimal formal education, a little bit of NAPSEP, and have electrician's license. So this, the, the entries uh, have dropped. We do a lot of internal training, but we do need, um, we do prefer to have formal training. It, it advances a person's career uh, more significantly. And the last slide I'm not gonna review, but it just raises some really important questions I think that we need to address in this energy transition, which um, needs to change the course that we've been on um, in our capitalistic society. So thank you. All right, thank you very much. So I think at this point, we're going to circle back um, and we had some questions for, for Bernie. Okay. Um, yes? Aaron Sanborn is next. Oh, I totally missed Aaron. <laughs> I apologize, Aaron. So um, as uh, I've just been reminded, Aaron Sanborn is next from Kit Carson Electric. Thank you, Aaron. Hi there, thank you for having Sorry me. Sorry about that. That's all right, and thanks for including Kit Carson Electric Co-op in this conversation. Um, we're finding that workforce development, of course, is critically important to future our business. Most of you know Kit Carson Electric Co-op, we're a member-owned distribution utility regulated by the PRC. And we have very aggressive renewable energy goals of 100% daytime solar by 2022. We are currently implementing um, distribution or utility-wide solar plus battery storage systems. Those will be online in 2021. And we're also working on different grid modernization components, which I'll talk about a little bit. So we're proud to say, and I think we can commit, we are gonna meet the ETA goals early, and we're also part of the Grid Modernization Advisory Council. So one of the things that has shifted that is impacts workforce development is we have increased the number of partners that we're working with. So Guzman Energy is our energy supplier, um, and they have needs for IT capability. We're working with Kamu Energy to build a grid um, orchestration and operations dashboard, which also requires um, new skills in terms of our current workforce and then also building out our broadband capacity, our skills and capabilities there. We're working with Torch Energy on the new battery energy storage systems that are going online in Angel Fire and near the Taos Airport. We're also working with like the Regulatory Assistance Project, the National Renewable Energy Lab. We started with the project that was called DG Squared or um, Distributed Energy on Distribution Grids Squared and that's Kemu Energy the next level we're working as we can with Sandia Labs and the National um, um, Cooperative Association on cybersecurity. So all of those have implications in terms of the kinds of skills and capabilities we either need in our workforce or in new hires. Um, so some of the trends and implications that we're seeing is we are definitely seeing a shifting business model. So that that relates to the lowering cost of power, how we calculate that, how we do accounting, um, everything, how we monitor billing, how we upgrade and upskill billing. So those skills also are needing to change and shift in our company. And it's requiring quite a, what I would call a cultural shift. So it's a shift in transparency. It's a shift in information and data. It's a shift in how we look at the functionality of the systems that different vendors uh, are working with us on. Even our vendors are having to look at um, the functionality of the tools that they've offered us and how with more and more renewable energy on our system, those vendors are having to change um, the way that they're working with the distribution uh, cooperative. So that's a, that's a huge shift um, that we're experiencing. Another big shift that has a workforce or job implication is what I'll call the company cultural change. 
So we're moving from a traditional utility, as many of you have spoken about, to um, a utility that is really on the forefront of what it means to integrate renewable energy and what it means to service customers. So I think most of you also know we own Kit Person um, Internet or our broadband company. That has been a silver lining in terms of grid modernization because of course without broadband and high speed internet or fiber, you can't run a, a microgrid or smart meters or any of that. So that has been an amazing piece of work that has also required a level of cultural change. So our companies have to talk to each other and do business and problem solve in ways that they hadn't had before. Um, we are having to redesign workflows across the board um, between the broadband company and the electrical company. And what does it mean to run uh, a high penetration of renewables on our grid plus working with multiple vendors and new partners? So that then cascades down into what are the roles and, and responsibilities that have shifted and those are numerous. Um, so then that really brings up the question of do we hire from within and train from within or do we hire and train from without? And I think that will probably be the catch 22 and the point of dialogue into the next few years. So what I would request from the educators online is to help us um, educate employees and educate high school students and other community members who are seeking to get into this field. Where can they go? How do they improve their skills and capabilities? And how can we as a cooperative committed to economic development and community development help them find new jobs? So thank you. Thank you, Erin. Okay, now we will circle back to uh, the beginning of this. And um, I will introduce Bernie. Um, help me pronounce your last name. Is it Cotlier? Are you muted, Bernie? How's that? Now I can hear you. Great. Terrific. So, yeah, so Cotlier, is, this, is that how you pronounce your last name? Yes, it's Cotlier. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so I would like to introduce Bernie Cotlier, the Executive Director of the California and Nevada Labor Management Corporation, excuse me, uh, Cooperation Commission, um, which is a joint effort of the National Electrical Contractors Association and the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers that are two um, incredibly important and powerful um, forces in this country. And, um, and so Bernie's responsible for the development and implementation of sustainable energy education and training programs. And so we've prepared a, a few questions to kind of drill in some of the things that have come up um, over the past presentations, and then we'll go into the Q&A after this. So you ready, Bernie? I'm ready. Thank you, All Frank. Right. Okay, so um, I, I guess the opening question is, can you tell us a little bit more about uh, IBEW and NECA um, and what you do in these various roles? Sure, I'd be glad to. So first of all, the IBW or the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers is uh, the Electrical Workers Union and it's more than a hundred years old. And uh, the IBW has members who are electricians and actually some other crafts as well uh, in every state in the United States. Uh, the IBW was founded in St. Louis, uh, that's local one and there are locals pretty much in every major city and medium-sized city, even in some small cities all over the country. And uh, NECA is the National Electrical Contractors Association, uh, who are the employers. Sometimes there's some confusion between, you know, what's a contractor and what's an electrician, but they're very different. The contractors actually make the contract with the customer. They are the employers. They're not the electricians. The electricians are their employ employees. So the National Electrical Contractors Association has thousands of members, uh, businesses that do electrical contracting, and they range in size from small, maybe a shop that only has a few electricians, all the way to multi-billion dollar, uh, very large companies that have regional, national, and international footprints. What major trends are you and your, your partners seeing in distributed electrical systems and technologies? Well, first of all, Frank, I don't think I asked you a question about what I do. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, just stop for a breather there. Um, so 
what do I do for uh, IBW and NECA? Well, first of all, I work in California and Nevada. We have a two-state organization that represents our electrical industry in both of those states. So the electrical contracting industry representing the employers and the employees in California, Nevada has a labor management cooperation committee. And that does what it says. It uh, enables management and labor to work together for the benefit of the electrical contracting industry. Uh, of course, you know, a lot of people think I work for the IBW or they think I work for NECA. And actually I don't work for either one, I, I work for both. And I can only uh, talk about things and work on projects where both the employers and the employees agree. So, you know, I spend a lot of time on the beach. Just kidding. Um, actually, we have a great uh, synergy in our industry and a great cooperation and collaboration. And um, in the almost 14 years I've been doing this work, we've never had a major issue where our employers, the contractors and our employees, electricians had had a major disagreement. So um, it's, um, it's an exciting uh, way to move our industry forward. And my job is primarily devoted to sustainable energy. And uh, I've worked uh, on solar energy, electric vehicles, energy storage, um, you name it, if it has to do with sustainable energy, energy efficiency, uh, that's what we do. And, and we work in a lot of different areas. We work on training, of course, and education, but we also work with our, uh, le our regulatory agencies and we work for the benefit of the whole industry to advance them in being the best they can be in sustainable energy. All right, thank you. So then now with, with uh, advances in sustainable energy, what are the major trends that, that you're seeing in, in this kind of a space? Well, we're seeing a lot of them. Uh, of course, um, you know, the, the first big project we worked on about 14 years ago was the rapid growth of solar energy. And that's still going on, as we all know, um, and, it, and it hasn't stopped. But what's interesting about solar, and that's been touched on by a number of people today, is of course, energy storage is being added to solar to make microgrids. And microgrids are growing rapidly for many reasons. Um, there's a lot of applications for microgrids, as we all know. Some of the more exciting ones are the replacement of peak, peaker plants, where we see um, instead of taking four or five years to build a peaker plant that might only be used a few weeks uh, a year, uh, we're seeing uh, utilities and other providers uh, maybe renting or buying a warehouse or building a warehouse, filling it full of batteries, and within six months or maybe uh, a little more time, but usually less than a year, uh, we have a functioning um, energy storage facility, which not only serves the uh, needs uh, of, of the utility in re replacing a peaker plant, but also as we know, energy storage provides a lot of other benefits as well. Mm -hmm. So there's energy storage obviously added to solar and making microgrids. Uh, electric vehicles are another really big area, obviously, they're growing. Now, they're not growing in every state as much as they're growing in California, uh, but a lot of states are seeing significant increases. And um, we've passed some uh, major legislation in California and had also some major regulatory advances in California that have to do with the electrification of the transportation sector. Um, about two years ago, we passed a landmark zero emission bus rule that was um, passed by the California Air Resources Board, otherwise known as CARB, uh, which says that all our major transit uh, agencies in the state will have 100% zero emission buses by 2040. And that's starting now. So they're replacing the fossil fuel buses with zero emission, mostly electric, and maybe some fuel cell buses in the mix. And most recently, just a few weeks ago, the um, Air Resources Board passed the clean truck rule which means that we're gonna have a lot of clean trucks on the market. Uh, roughly 15% of the trucks by 2030 will have to be zero emission trucks. Once again, mostly electric and maybe some fuel cells in the mix. Okay, so you talked about social, regulatory and, and technical changes. Um, how do you think these translate into workforce needs? <laughs> well, obviously uh, we need a lot of people to do a lot of work. Um, 
you know, the, the green uh, energy sector, sustainable energy sector in California alone employs more people than all the coal related workers in the United States. So gives you some idea of the magnitude of what's going on right now. And we have some very ambitious goals uh, in California and Nevada, actually. Um, you know, we have, uh, for instance, uh, I mentioned these two regulatory goals, but we also uh, have for all electric vehicles, as an example, we have a goal of having 250,000 charging stations added to our network by 2025. That's a lot of work. Uh, we have obviously all this energy storage that's going in along with the solar, uh, all the microgrids that are being built. So literally there will be tens of thousands, if not uh, more than 100,000 new jobs created just in the next few years in the sustainable energy sector. Now that has, um, that has raised questions about the adequacy of the workforce. And there's, uh, there's a lot of good news in that. Uh, first of all, it does create a lot more work and particularly now with uh, some of the uh, economic consequences of the pandemic, people are certainly more concerned about that, that now than they were last year when uh, maybe there was, we were closer to full employment. So it's gonna create a lot of new jobs. Uh, but the good news is, is that we already have a tremendous workforce. Uh, I'm of, of course focused on the electrical workforce and when we talk about microgrids or or energy efficiency or, or electric vehicles, um, we're talking about electricians doing the work. Now, I know there's references to things, you know, to terms like technicians and, you know, various other worker references. But when we're talking about this electrical work, we're talking about electricians. And we are fortunate in California and we have a workforce of 37,000 electricians and elect uh, electrical workers, including apprentices. Apprentices are not electricians, but they are electrical workers on their way to be electricians. So we have a total workforce of 37,000. And the good news is, is that we've done the calculations about how many workers it takes to put in those 250,000 charging stations. Well, surprise, surprise, we don't have to train thousands and thousands of new people to do that. That takes 6.7% uh, of the existing workforce to install 250,000 charging stations. Um, so that does, but that doesn't mean we're not gonna have to train new people, but it does mean it's not a crisis. We're not in a crisis where we have to spend hundreds of millions of dollars training masses of people to install uh, these charging stations or the microgrids or other, uh, doing other electrical work, but we have to continue to train and we have to make sure that as we're training these uh, apprentices who become electricians, that we're giving them the latest in technology that we're giving them the training in how to safely and effectively install energy storage and microgrids, how we're safely and effectively install these charging stations. So we have to continue, we have to expand at a reasonable pace, and we have to make sure they have the right training. Okay, yeah, so, um, so the workforce is largely prepared. They have the, the, the fundamental skills, we've got to adapt them. Um, so you go a little bit more into what the specific implications then are for education and training to make sure that you get them where you need them to be? Yeah, Frank, you touched on a really important point, and that is, is that we're, cha uh, we're training on the foundation of very uh, significant skills. So uh, if you take the IBW training program as an example, it's not the only one, but we think it's the best. Uh, that's a five-year apprenticeship, five years, 9,000 hours, uh, an apprentice uh, in, in the IBW, actually anywhere in the country, to become uh, a master electrician or a state certified electrician in our case, uh, or a licensed electrician, depends on the state and the, the nomenclature. Uh, they, they have to put in 8,000 hours on the job and 1,000 hours in the, in the classroom. Uh, and they have considerable labs and lectures. And plus, you know, they're working with a master electrician uh, on the job every day, they're supervised, whether they're a first year apprentice or a fifth year apprentice. So when they come out, when they turn out, as they say, or graduate after five years of this, they're incredibly knowledgeable. And that is really fortunate for the future of sustainable energy and our current needs, because 
when we train someone to do, for instance, energy storage and microgrids or electric vehicles, we're building on that foundation of five years minimum of training. So for instance, for electric vehicles, we have a course that's about 24 hours. And people say, well, how can you train somebody in 24 hours? Well, we're not training them in 24 hours, we're training them in 9,024 hours. So um, we can build on that foundation very effectively. All right, thank you. Um, so um, at this point, um, we're a little short on time. So I would like to see if we've got, we've got time for maybe one question um, from, from people out there. And so if somebody's got something they'd like to put up for Bernie or for our panelists, um, that would be, that now would be the time to do that. I'm in the chat, I believe this time. Does anyone have anything for our panelists? seen anything right now. Nobody has any questions for any of our panelists? We have a lot of knowledgeable people with a lot of insight here. So now's your chance. Well, Frank, if it turns out we have a couple more minutes, I'll, I'll give you a little more information about eSEMTAC, which I, I know was one of the questions, but uh, let's oh, we see do, if we have other we questions. Do, we, do have, we do have one question, Bernie. Um, and, and, uh, and the question in the chat is, how do you see apprenticeships and classroom instruction working together to qualify the workforce? Well, actually, apprenticeship includes uh, classroom inst instruction. Uh, we have a thousand hours of classroom instruction built into the apprenticeship. Uh, if, if the questioner is uh, asking about other types of classroom um, uh, training, uh, possibly uh, in high schools or community colleges or other venues, it's fantastic. And, and it helps build the workforce uh, uh, eligibility because uh, for instance, in electrical apprenticeship, you have to be very good at, at math. You have, to be, you have to have a good command and mastery of algebra. You have to have other you know, skills, reading and writing skills. So all the, the training uh, and education that contributes to that preparation is very valuable. Okay, and then in, uh, in one minute or less, um, what do you see um, as the role for community colleges um, when we're talking about uh, upskilling our workforce? Tremendous role. Um, as, as, as you may know, we have 113 of them in California <laughs> and they have been a huge asset. And I know they're a huge asset in, in all the other states as well because they contribute to first of all, general uh, education of our workforce so they can read better, write better, do math better. But also many community colleges have uh, pre-apprenticeship programs, they have energy programs, and all of these types of education are helping prepare our workforce and incredibly valuable. Thank you very much. All right, thanks, Barney. Thank you to our panelists. At this point, we're going to move into the breakout sessions. Um, Zoom is going to automatically place you into your breakout groups for the moderator and, and panelists. Um, and then at the end of that, you will automatically be returned back into the large group um, or you can uh, return it at any time. Um, and the question for the breakout section sessions is what should colleges be thinking about and doing to address distributed energy workforce needs? So take that question with you into your breakouts. Um, Hey everybody, welcome back. As we're, as we're joining the main group, I'd ask everybody except for our moderators to turn off your camera and mute your microphone. All right, so is that then, am I asking for the uh, um, report backs then, Selena? Let's make sure we've got everybody back. I think we do. And Frank, you can go ahead and, and take it from here. So, so Frank asked the breakout matter. Okay, reporting less. Um, I, I guess I can uh, start on the one that I was in and say, uh, uh, so, Ann Jekyll, what do you have from the group that you were in? 
Um, well, first I want to say if anybody didn't get to have their say, um, please message me privately in the chat and I'll include your thoughts in the notes that will go into the wrap up for everything. So um, sorry that we, we kind of ran a little short on time. But very briefly, um, some high level things that we heard. Um, we People said that we needed dual credit programs and to reach out to high schools to make sure to think about the whole pipeline, high school into college. Also, I, I really like the idea of on ramps and boot camps, these ideas of short courses and micro credentials where people can kind of jump in and out of learning their skills. Um, Finally, I, I heard um, one important point that we need to keep in mind from a student who is part of one of these programs right now in New Mexico is that he hopes to stay and transition to a job in New Mexico. So really thinking about what the workforce is in New Mexico and designing our programs to support that is important. Thanks. All right. Um, thank you, man. I think I had something to say and now I've forgotten what it is. So while I think of that, um, ISIS. Hello, everyone. Um, from our panel, uh, one of the big um, takeaways was there needs to be the tie between the tech and the administrative um, roles with degrees and skill sets. Um, David Rieger pointed out that we need people ready to go into the workforce now, but they also need to be able to evolve um, over time with the changes that are going to be occurring. Um, also, from uh, one of the people in our panel was a student, and so from his perspective was um, we need a good connection or a link or a clear path between school and the workforce. So providing internships, degrees that will connect you directly to industries. Okay. Um, all right. Thank you. Um, Andra? Thank you. So we had four main takeaways from our group. Um, the first was that we need a focus on construction safety. We need people to be coming out with a firm understanding of that. We also need people coming out of our pipelines with a quality orientation. Um, uh, as Isis mentioned, um, that we realize that this is evolving quickly and that so we need to train people um, so that they have a capacity to learn as the industry and their jobs continue to evolve. Um, we also discussed, much like Anne's group did, that we need to start these apprenticeships and internships at younger ages and when our participants are earlier in their career pathways. And that was our group. Okay. Um, Sarah, please. Hello, all. We had a we had a wonderful um, a, a wonderful group with a lot of ideas that were generated. Uh, we talked about the rapid change that's happening um, in this field and the need to incorporate those changes within uh, academic and kind of uh, other other training groups. We also spoke about the interdisciplinary need um, that needs to be interwoven into kind of all academic modalities of complex energy systems. Uh, we really spoke about the need of having more hands-on internship experience prior to them gaining into the workforce. And then we talked about really developing critical thinking and capability skills um, versus kind of hard technical skills and getting more critical thinking skills into um, kind of prerequisites and other kind of high school um, courses as well. Thank you. Um, I know that um, uh, Brittany's name is on there, but she didn't have a breakout group. One of the things that I heard as we're putting this program together, I just want to um, put in is um, we are very much attempting to develop this program, and you're going to hear a lot more about it tomorrow, so I don't want to dwell on it, but um, the, uh, a program that covers um, various aspects from cybersecurity to one of the things that I just heard was like OSHA. So one of the first courses in our certificate program gets students in OSHA, OSHA 30 qualifications. So we're making sure that students understand OSHA. We're making sure that they understand um, uh, codes, NEC, um, uh, basic foundations from math to, um, uh, to, to areas in computer science. So you're going to hear a lot more about that tomorrow. But right now, I am going to then hand it back to, is it to you, um, uh, Camilla or Selena? Camilla's next. I'm next. Right. Thank you all. Um, Thank you all. Just to wrap up from our day today, um, we're going to do a quick poll. So um, I will ask, so you see on the screen, you have day one wrap up poll. Um, and you're going to do this just in time. You'll be able to answer these questions and we'll be able to see the results of this poll um, just like right away. 
My level of understanding about and interest in the distributed energy system is low, medium, or high. Go ahead and submit your answers now. We'll keep it open for five more seconds. Camilla, can you see the results? Absolutely, thank you. So they're in. Um, good, so we have a larger group with a high understanding um, of distributed energy systems and just a few of us who feel that our understanding and um, interest is somewhat low. So thank you all very much. Are there um, any other questions for the poll, Selena? Nope, we're all nope. done. <laughs> so we're really grateful for all your time today. We look forward to seeing you in the morning. Um, you have your uh, login in your e-agenda. Um, look forward to seeing you all at nine o'clock tomorrow morning. Thank you very, very much and stay well.